Well, I guess I lied about this video being light and fluffy, huh? So in the second video I posted to this channel, I discussed the character of Jules in the HBO show Euphoria, and especially discussed the character in the context of Jules being a trans woman portrayed by Hunter Schaefer, who worked closely with showrunner Sam Levinson to ensure an accurate portrayal. This time, I thought I'd take a look at a few cases in popular cinema where in movies that contain explicit themes about the trans experience and are about real life trans people, end up casting cisgender actors to play trans people. So we're going to be looking at The Danish Girl from 2015 starring Eddie Redmayne as Lily Elba and Boys Don't Cry starring Hilary Swank as Brandon Tina, released all the way back in 1999. The Danish Girl comes courtesy director Tom Hooper, which at this point is as much courtesy as a kick in the vagina. It stars Eddie Redmayne as Lily Elba, one of the first trans women on record to get the at the time very experimental gender confirmation surgery, and who in reality was kind of the guinea pig for a few transition related surgeries. The focus on the film is mainly on Lily's continuing relationship with her wife Gerda, played by Alicia Vikander, as she discovers herself and transitions. I want to state up front that I don't hate this movie. There's parts of it I really like, and parts that I wish were better developed and fleshed out. Lily Elba's story is one that I feel like it rarely told in trans circles, and it makes for a compelling narrative. Her diary became one of the first trans memoirs we still have that was published all the way back in 1933. This is a story that is important to the history of trans people, and to be able to tell it in a way that can be beautiful and emotionally provocative would be immensely positive to the trans experience. It's really sad that viewing this as a person who is knowledgeable about the topic, that I don't have the necessary gel man amnesia to enjoy the film. And it's not even the surface stuff that bothers me. Despite the fact that Lily Elba didn't die after her second surgery, she died after she got an infection related to an attempted uterus transplant, and that she'd been married for a lot longer than the movie seems to think, and that there's speculation that she might have even been intersex, and that the movie contains zero mention of Magnus Hirschfeld, who was one of the first people to actively study trans people in Weimar, Germany, before all of his research was destroyed by the Nazis and... <laughs> okay, this deserves its own video. The Danish Girl is about 40 minutes of a beautiful movie about self-discovery, intercut with about 120 minutes of trans torture porn. There's a scene early on where Lily puts on stockings and shoes for her wife to paint and she feels the fabric on her legs and their friend Ola comes in and calls her Lily for the first time and it's a beautiful moment. Followed shortly by a montage of Lily and Gerda going through their costumes and putting on makeup and making her fully Lily for the first time. It's a beautiful scene. It's upbeat. The music is peppy and fun. Eddie Redmayne and Alicia Vikander pay off each other so well. The performances are wonderful, but that scene and so few scenes after that are filled with the joy that I wish this movie had. Most of it feels crushingly depressing and sucked free of all the joy of the first half. There's multiple scenes of people trying to lock Lily up in mental institutions. Lily has so little agency in the plot at all once it gets rolling. And apparently all it actually takes to make Lily happy is a good cis person showing up and treating her like a fucking human. It feels like the director wants the audience to pat itself on the back like, yay, look at us, the good cis people, when the thorough and continued marginalization of trans people continues to this day. And this is where dissecting Eddie Redmayne's performance comes in, because as I said, outside of the fun that they seem to have while she's dressing up and going to parties and learning to walk and act feminine, all of these moments of joy are broken up by effectively having Eddie Redmayne look to the camera and tell everyone how much agony Lily is in. And so much of the film is this way. One of the more pivotal scenes, she runs away from her wife to their studio and stands in front of the mirror naked and imagines herself with a female body. It's one of the reasons I call it effectively trans torture porn. At a certain point, this movie is calling attention to the pain of the trans experience almost to the exclusion of every other aspect. Eddie Redmayne is a good actor, and watching interviews with him in this part, I get the sense that he has more insight into the experience after doing the role. But the problem I have is that there's the fakeness to this performance. So many of these scenes look like someone imagined what it would be like to be trans instead of, you know, asking someone who's actually trans. In the film, Lily dies of complications after her surgery, and her final moments are a very somber moment. But what it does is it caps off the film with what I consider to be the flaw that brings its downfall. Lily dies after she fully becomes a woman in her own eyes through surgery. 
and that it only seems to be concerned with the surgical aspect. It only seems to be concerned with the raw physical suffering of a trans person. The only perspective it can seem to give is the perspective of the trans experience as one built on pain and suffering. It's a very cis view of what being trans must look like. And Eddie Redmayne, while he does a good job given the material he has to work with, I can't help but wonder whether an actual trans woman wouldn't have done a better job. I'm more inclined to argue that by casting someone like Eddie Redmayne in this role, the pool of potential roles for trans woman actresses has gotten smaller. It's similar to the issue of whitewashing characters who were originally people of color, such as the case with Scarlett Johansson taking the role as Major Kusanagi in the recent live-action Ghost in the Shell adaptation, which was a role that Rinko Kikuchi was basically born to play, and yes, I am still mad about that. Scarlett Johansson herself got into hot water over her being cast as Dante Gill in a potential movie called Rub and Tug, which she reluctantly stepped down from before the movie was made, giving this wonderful quote, I should be able to play any person, any tree, any animal, to which I would respond that a sufficiently curvy tree could play any Scarlett Johansson part. And she only pulled out of that role because of a massive public backlash. That role should be filled by a real trans man actor. And speaking of roles that should be filled by actual trans men, Boys Don't Cry is a 1999 comedy drama starring Hilary Swank as Brandon Tina, a real-life trans man who was raped and murdered after running away to the town of Fall City, Nebraska in 1993. Brandon Tina is a significant case in the history of trans activism because his murder was one of the first to gain widespread attention from mainstream sources. The story spawned a 1998 documentary called The Brandon Tina Story, as well as the film Boys Don't Cry. It focuses in on Brandon's life as a man and his relationship with Lana Tisdale, and his continuing attempts to not only hide his being assigned female at birth, but his continuing struggle with the legal system, which ultimately is what reveals that he is trans and causes his murder. The weirdest thing that came out of watching this movie, though, and something that I wasn't expecting with a film about a trans man from 1999 played by a cis actress was that I really liked it. It's a fun movie and a really good love story. And I think I know why I liked it. The tragedy of Brandon Tina is not one of self-discovery or gender-related anxiety. It is a story rooted in bigotry and hate, but that's not what the film gives us. The film wisely gives us a view of Brandon as a fully realized man. He goes out with girls, he goofs around with other guys, he gets into dude bro guy talk, they accept him as who he is and they treat him like a man. Most of the movie's runtime is grounded not just in Brandon living a happy life as a man, but what actually makes Brandon into a guy out of any other rom-com. Which is stunningly refreshing after the absolute travesty that was the Danish girl, which seemed to revel in watching Eddie Redmayne look into the camera and cry. Here we see Brandon living his life. I think the reasoning behind this is clear. Back in 1999, when the film was in production, most people simply didn't know what being trans was or what it was about. The filmmakers wisely chose to portray Brandon Tina as a relatable average guy, which is the last thing I was expecting. I'm probably being a little too charitable to this film because of how early on it was in the trans representation. I would have much rather seen an actual trans man in the lead role as there's an authenticity to the experience that I think is somewhat lacking by having Hilary Swank acting it out as opposed to a trans man showing up and giving a real performance. I realized again, it was 1999. No one was going to actually do that or risk a crying game situation. Yeah, it doesn't use the most progressive language in the world, but Boys Don't Cry fundamentally understands what it feels like to be trans. It's not about suffering, it's about becoming comfortable in your gender. And all of that comes in stark contrast to other examples of trans representation, which put bluntly feel like trans torture porn than everything else in retrospect. In The Danish Girl, everything Lily goes through is framed by the framing, the dialogue, the way she's treated by the rest of the characters. All of it reeks of a self-congratulating fantasy of trans love and acceptance. Like the audience is supposed to be coming out of the film patting themselves on the back for having solved the transgender issue through performative wokeness. And the biggest insult of his all is that a movie from nearly 20 years before did everything it did but better. Trans characters being played by cisgender actors seem to still somehow be a prevailing trend, and as harmful culturally as outlined before. 
Therefore, I'd like to propose the term transface to refer to this phenomenon, defined by myself as a transgender character being portrayed by a cisgender actor of the same gender assigned at birth to the character. I recognize the parallel to blackface is loaded historically, but I honestly think this kind of representation is harmful on that level. It's not just a trans person being played by a cis person. That's not what it's about. It's about stories that are fundamentally about the experience of being trans being told without the involvement of the people whose experience they are showing. And the resulting caricature is damaging to the movement and to the people the movement directly affects. This isn't just Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's. This is like if Mickey Rooney from Breakfast at Tiffany's was starring in Crazy Rich Asians. The film is significant to the visibility and experience of the culture and people it represents, but is portrayed through exaggerated caricature written by people who have no experience in the culture. So the way forward is to let trans and gender diverse people tell their own stories, because as you see with films like Crazy Rich Asians, Parasite, 12 Years a Slave, and the entire filmography of Spike Lee, that not only can films like these bring visibility and awareness and representation to the cultures and people they represent, they make some fucking awesome movies.